Good morning, church. I'm excited to be here with you. Um, so some of you are aware, many of you may not be aware, uh, but my wife and I had our first baby back in December, uh, and I talk about him a lot. So if you've, if you've heard about him before, then I apologize. I like to talk about him. As you can see, he is probably the cutest baby of all time. Um, his name is Gabriel Jude, um, and he's, he's amazing. I've never thought that I would enjoy being around a baby as, as, I, as much as I did. And, and one thing that you'll notice from some of those images, uh, I hope, is that he is an incredibly happy baby. Uh, if you've spent any time around us, he's generally pretty happy. He's got the cheesiest little grin, and he's got a corny little laugh that he, uh, that he gives us all the time. So most of the time, he's a very happy baby, which makes it real easy on mom and dad. We're very grateful for that. Uh, however, over the past couple weeks and months, he has started to develop a, a little bit more of a personality, um, and he's starting to, you know, range in emotions a little bit more, or as I will, would like to call it, he's a little bit more opinionated as of late. Um, so he's doing this really cool thing uh, where he loves to just grab things. Uh, anything he sees, if he's never seen it before, he just immediately lunges and will grab onto it and hold onto it. And it doesn't matter what it is. It could be his own ball or the dog toy. It could also be the knives on the kitchen refrigerator. Homeboy just goes and reaches and tries to grab onto it. He just likes to grab things. Uh, and he's doing this thing now that when we take something from him, whether uh, it's something dangerous or if it's something he's supposed to have, but it's time to be done with it, uh, he starts to cry now. He'll start to cry. And it, it, it's really sad. And here's the hard part is that he starts to cry and he doesn't understand why we're taking it from him. And he's just about eight months old and he doesn't speak English yet. So I can't really communicate. So I'm like, Gabriel, like, hey, like, no, no, no. We, we don't cry about these things because this is why we can't have it. He, he doesn't care. He has, he has no recollection of anything that I'm trying to tell him right now. Uh, but he cries when we take things away from him. Um, and, and even if it's something that he shouldn't have, like the kitchen knives, if he tries to go and reach them, say, Gabriel, no, you can't have that. Why? He cries because he wants something that he believes uh, will make him happy, will make him comfortable, or make him feel safe. Whether it's good for him or not, he wants this thing. So Mariah and I's job as the parents uh, is to determine, no, this is not something that, that you should have. You can take that off the screen so we're not distracted anymore, as much as I would love to have that up there all day. Uh, but so there's something about that that I think is true for our own lives, that oftentimes we will create walls or we will hold on to things, whether they're good for us or not. Why? Because they make us feel safe, they make us feel comfortable, and we like the presence of it because we don't like the alternative of releasing it. We're going to get into a little bit of what that could mean, and I want to kind of probe the question of what could that look like? How would we know if that were us? And the past couple of weeks, we've been uh, going through a series of conversations on the Lord's Prayer. Uh, and each week, we've taken a small piece of this Lord's Prayer um, and kind of dissected it a little bit more. So we're going to do that again today. Um, and here's what we're going to do. Um, we're, I'm going to read a couple verses before the, the Lord's Prayer, because I think it gives us uh, some more context for what's happening. And then when we get to the Lord's Prayer, we're going to read that all out loud together. Does that sound good? We're going to use our outdoor voices. It's going to be a ton of fun. All right. So this is in Matthew chapter 6, starting in verse Verse five, it says, when you pray, you should not be like the hypocrites for they love to pray standing in the synagogues, in the corners of the streets, that they may be seen by men. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward, but you, when you pray, go into your room. And when you have shut your door, pray to the father who is in secret place and your father who sees in secret will reward you openly. And when you pray, do not use vain repetitions as the heathens do, uh, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. Therefore, do not be like them, for your Father knows the things that you need before you ask Him. In this manner, therefore, pray. And this is where we all come together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And then it continues right after, just two more verses. It says, For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. 
Do you believe uh, that prayer can actually change you? Do you believe that prayer can actually change something inside of you? And, and what is your reaction when you first hear this Lord's Prayer? Have you heard it a thousand times and maybe you're like, you know, it's like hearing your favorite song over and over and over again. It, it kind of loses a lot of its power. Is it, is it like that for you? Or maybe this is one of the first times you've ever heard this prayer and you're confused. You don't know exactly what it means. What is your reaction uh, to this? And, and I, I think that Jesus is, is informing us and giving us a model for something incredibly powerful here. And I want to spend this morning discovering two different things. Number one, what is the purpose and the power of this prayer that Jesus gives us? And number two, how can it change our lives and more specifically in the realm of forgiveness? How can it change your lives in the realm of forgiveness? So Jesus opens this up and he says, there are two ways that you can pray. There's two ways. One's really good, one's really bad. So there's option one. Option one's the bad way. He says, don't pray like this. There's a way in which we can pray that is very self-centered. A way that we can pray that is focused on ourselves, but more importantly, focused on building up walls around ourselves that distance ourselves from others, that elevate ourselves, or at least create some kind of a void between us and others. Maybe it boosts our own respect. Maybe it boosts our own uh, visual of how people see us in the world. Uh, but it is a very self-centered prayer that builds up walls, that holds on to something, whether it's good for us or not, because we're afraid of, of what would happen if we would release it. It's a very self-centered kind of prayer. It's option one. Option two, it is the kind of prayer that reorientates our, how, our hearts to refocus our hearts on God and others. And the difference in this kind of prayer is a prayer, it is a prayer of sacrifice. It's a prayer of sacrifice. So we're going to look at uh, these two things. And, and one leads to hurt. One leads to more bondage, I believe. And we're going to talk about that in our life. The other one, I think, the option two, this prayer, when we're focused more on God and others through our prayers, I believe is what happens. It allows for more deeper and personal growth inside of our hearts and inside of our lives, which then allows us to go out and change the world around us. Because if we're changing first, then we can go out and change the world around us. But ultimately, I want to look at how this kind of prayer has the ability to bring more freedom to our lives, specifically in the realm of forgiveness. So Jesus starts off right off the bat in, in verse five. He, he, says, he says, do not be like the hypocrites. First things first, if, if Jesus is calling you a hypocrite, you're probably in the wrong. <laughs> Let's get that right out of, the, out of the way first. He says, don't be like them. They go out into the street corner so everybody can hear them. They pray so that their own reputation can be built up. And again, they're building these walls around themselves, distancing themselves uh, from other people. He says, don't be like those people. It is a very self-centered way in which they are to live. And instead, he, pr he offers us a different kind of opportunity. He models for us something bigger and deeper that requires sacrifice. How many of us would like to pray in a way that can truly change us? Could you imagine for a moment if your prayers had the ability to change something deep inside of you that then gives you the strength, the wisdom, and the power to go out and change the outward circumstances of the world around you? What could it look like if we prayed sacrificially every single day? So how do we do that? How does that become something or, or someone that we are or something that we do that we can participate in? And I want to look back at this prayer. And I want to look at the structure of this prayer because I think it gives us uh, some insight. So I'm going to turn your attention back to the screen. It's going to be right up on there. And the first part of this prayer, the first part of this prayer is, is almost solely focused on turning and reorientating our hearts and our attention back to God. It says this, our father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. It's us shifting our focus back to God to recognize that he is the kingly authority of our lives, that, that he is the one in charge, that he is above all things, that he is greater than us. We are shifting the attention of our hearts to recognize that in this prayer. But then the second part, the second half is, is a prayer that is more centered around us, 
I want you to notice the repeated use of the word us in the second half. It says, give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. It is a combination. It is a prayer that first centers its attention on loving God first, above all things, loving God first, and then loving ourselves and the people around us, loving God and then loving others. Does that sound familiar to you? It is very, very similar, and I think intentionally similar to the, another commandment that Jesus gives called the Lord's commandment, where he says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and all your mind. This is the first and the greatest commandment. The second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. This commandment is the thesis, the mission statement of everything that Jesus came to do and everything that he has called us to do if we are followers of Jesus. To love God, to put him first, to give everything that you have to God, but then after that, to love God others. And I believe that what Jesus is doing here in this prayer is that he is reminding us, he is giving us a means of, of which we can pray that centers our attention on loving God, but then also loving others at the same time. And the question is, why would, why would this happen? Why would this be the case? Why is this important? Why are we nerding out about this really weird thing? I think that Jesus is going after the aspect that sometimes it is so tempting for us to silo these relationships. And what I mean by that is to say oftentimes that we think that if I am loving God, if I am obedient to God and I am following after he says, then I do not need to be loving to other people. Or maybe it's not as big of a deal because I'm doing everything that he's asked me to do. And Jesus is saying through this commandment and through this prayer that you cannot separate these two things. You cannot separate loving God and loving others. Both of them go together. There is a relationship between both of these things that have to go together. It is impossible to treat people poorly and, and claim to love God and same vice versa. Both of these things go together. And Jesus is offering us a means in which we can center our focus off of our own selves back to God and back to others. It is a prayer of sacrifice that addresses the things in our heart that we're holding on to that may not be good for us, but we're holding on to and reorientates our heart to something greater, back to Jesus' mission. Does that make sense for me and you today? Okay, three people made sense for her. I'm glad, I'm glad. Does that make sense for you guys today? Okay, you don't gotta lie to me, but it makes me feel better at least. So here, here we've talked a little bit about like this idea of like selfless prayer. So this mean, if we're gonna pray selflessly, does this mean that we cannot ask for the things that we want in our lives? And I, no, I don't believe so. Does it mean we can't ask for the things that we need in our life? No, of course not. Part of this prayer is Jesus saying, give us this day our daily bread. We are supposed to, and in fact, we are invited to pray for the things that, that we not only need, but also the things that, that we want sometimes. Doesn't mean that we will get them always, but Jesus invites us into that kind of prayer. This, this is not what this, this prayer is saying. This means that we have to have a low uh, self view of ourselves in order to pray properly. And, and of course not. Uh, part of this commandment says, love others as you have loved yourself, which means that you need to have a healthy amount of respect and love for yourself in order to properly love other people. So, so what is Jesus getting at in this prayer? I believe that Jesus is asking us to pray sacrificially. What would it look like if we could pray sacrificially every single day? How would that change you? How would that change the world around you? Would there be a difference? So I want to take a couple, a look at a couple verses that are quite honestly very intimidating for me. In fact, they strike a ton of fear into my heart sometimes. <laughs> Um, and, and you may be thinking this as well when we first read it. And this is what it could look like if, if we were uh, living our lives uh, maybe a little too self-centeredly. And I, I want to unpack that a little bit. So bear with me. Verse 12 says this. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors or those who have hurt us or sinned against us. In verse 14, this is the kicker. 
For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. How many of you might lose a little bit of sleep tonight thinking about that? What does this mean? This means that if, if I'm not up to date on all my forgiveness tabs, if I haven't checked off all of my checklist things, does that mean that, that God's not going to forgive me? Because I don't know about you, but I don't want to be in a position where God's not going to forgive me. I don't, I don't want to be there. That doesn't sound like a very good time. So, so what do I have to do in order to improve this? And so what does this mean? What is Jesus trying to get at this? With, because this can be incredibly terrifying and intimidating uh, at, at first glance here. And, and I believe that G, what Jesus is doing is he's tapping to, into this idea again that our relationship with God is so closely connected to our relationship with others that if we are in a moment or a state where we are unforgiving towards somebody else, it is an indicator that there might be a piece of our heart that is hardening itself towards God. If we are in a mode where we are unforgiving others, somebody that Jesus has already claimed forgiven, there may be a piece of our hearts that's not just hardening towards the individual or the group that has hurt us, but it is also hardening itself towards God. And as much as we don't want that to be true, as, as much as we don't want to see that happen, uh, God and Jesus is telling us here that you cannot separate these two relationships. They go hand in hand. Unforgiveness Unforgiveness hardens our hearts towards people and towards God. Towards people and towards God. Now, this is really important to recognize. That Jesus is not saying that if you find it difficult to forgive, um, or if you find it hard to forgive, or if it takes time for you to forgive, uh, then that's an automatic clue that your heart is hardening towards God. I don't think that's the case. I don't think that's what Jesus is talking about here, because I believe it is very difficult. I think Jesus recognizes that. I believe that this is a state of absolute refusal uh, to forgive someone, that, that, that God is challenging and saying, hey, your, your relationship is not quite right with me right now. Let's, let's get on this. Let's fix this. Let's go at this right now. And here's, here's what I'm also not saying here. I'm not saying that, that your relationship could be in jeopardy with God if you're walking through a season of unforgiveness. Again, there, it should be just an indicator, a clue that we have to then work on something deeper. Does that make sense for, for you and for me today? Okay, cool. So the question is for me is, is why? What is the danger of unforgiveness? What's the worst that could happen with unforgiveness? Because to be quite honest, um, if there is somebody who has hurt you or some, somebody who has did something wrong to you, sometimes it feels like it's almost a value or a virtue uh, to be angry at them sometimes. At least that's what our world tells us, that you should uh, feel hatred towards that individual, that group or whatever. Uh, so, so why is this such a big deal if they deserve it? Why is this a big deal? Pastor Bob has told this to me many times. He said it from the front room. It's one of my favorite quotes uh, he's ever said. Uh, and he says, unforgiveness is the poison that you drink while you wait for the other person to die. Unforgiveness is the poison that you drink while you wait for the other person to die. Being unwilling to forgive traps us in our own cell of bitterness. And everything is consumed by that. If you've ever been there, and I know that we've all been there, it can affect every single decision that you make. You can't even make a wise decision anymore because everything is through the lens of this bitterness, of this pain that you have walked through and gone through. And it can sometimes feel like anything can trigger this emotion, this pain back inside of you where you can almost become unstable uh, and living in this way because of this bitterness that we carry onto. And here's the thing. I don't actually believe that anybody wants to live that way. I don't believe anybody wants to hold the bitterness inside of our heart. Yet we do, we hold on to this thing, though it is not good for us, we hold on to this thing because we feel like they deserve it. And if we are not proactive about this, we will be stuck inside our own cage, our own cell of bitterness, bitterness. sometimes for days, weeks, months, sometimes years and decades, consumed by this. 
And I actually don't think anybody wants to be there. And what happens ultimately is not only you're stuck there, but you are missing out on a potential opportunity for God to change or grow or do something inside you or through you because you are not thinking or living clearly. And our hearts are being hardened towards God. If we really check deep down, we're not just mad at other people. Sometimes we're a little bit mad at God. So how do we learn how to forgive? How do we learn how to forgive? And I think there's two things that this prayer that Jesus gives us informs us. One, I'm going to go into really short. The second one, I think, is the, uh, the heart of what Jesus is doing in this prayer. So if you're in this mode today and you, uh, you feel like this bitterness is, has been consuming you or it's starting to grow and shift inside of your heart, the first thing I want you to remember is remember how much you have been forgiven. Remember how much you have been uh, forgiven. Verse 12, it says, uh, it reminds us, it says, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. I don't think it's an accident that we are first to remember that Jesus forgives us before we forgive others. And why is that? Because when we remember how much we are reliant on the grace of God, how much we need the strength and the access of God, how then can we not go and take that same forgiveness and extend it towards somebody who has hurt us as well? It is God's grace that is shaping us and, and, and molding us so that we have the, the grace to extend back to somebody else. So remember how much you have been forgiven. And this is not, sometimes people will, will try to make you like talk really bad about yourself and talk down about yourself and lower your self-esteem. This is not what it's about, but it's about us understanding our reliance and our need for God's strength and God's grace. Remember how much you have been forgiven. And so here's my second thing, and I want to press in on this because this is so big. Prayer changes things. Yes, even you. <laughs> Prayer changes things. Yes, even you. Jesus is encouraging us here that through prayer, we can wrestle with our own anger, our own emotions, our own bitterness, our own our hurt with God. We can engage in a practice where we can wrestle with God to, to give that hurt, to give that pain, to give that bitterness to God through the act of of prayer that we can start to learn to forgive. And oftentimes this can be frustrating, to be honest, because we will do this once or twice and then we become frustrated with the fact that, that we're not forgiven yet, that we're still working through this. And we think, well, maybe I didn't pray hard enough or maybe I'm not good at this or maybe, maybe I'm, my heart's hardening towards God or I'm terrified. And, and I think that Jesus didn't mean this to be a one-time thing. I actually think that Jesus intended us to pray this prayer every single day. That every day we are to remind ourselves of God's grace and then extend forgiveness out to somebody else. To wrestle with God this own self-centeredness, this thing that we're holding on to that we don't want to let go. To, to pray those things back and forth with God every day to ask for the strength to forgive again and again. And here's what I'm not saying. Here's what forgiveness is not, because this can be really unclear uh, sometimes. Uh, forgiveness is not trusting somebody who has hurt you again. What this is not saying is that you need to continually put yourself in a situation or a relationship where you're going to be repeated to be hurt over and over and over again. Trust and forgiveness are two very different things. Forgiveness is not even not seeking justice. Those are two very different things. You can seek justice, you can seek uh, the authorities and things and still forgive at the same time. Those are two very different things. And I, I wanna make sure we're, we're clear on that. But forgiveness is, essentially it's us saying, I am not going to retaliate against you. I'm not going to cause you the same harm that you have caused me. And more than that, it is us saying, I am giving this situation to you, God. I'm going to allow God to be the one who determines their outcome. I'm going to allow God to handle and deal with this person, this individual, this group. And I am removing myself from the equation. Ultimately, that is what forgiveness is. So Jesus provides this model in which we can use prayer 
to reorientate our heart back into a relationship, a healthy relationship, I would say, with God and a healthy relationship with others at the same time. And you may be saying, and I hear you on this, you may be saying, you don't understand, you have no idea what they have done to me, they have never apologized, they haven't even admitted wrong, they do not deserve my forgiveness. And I want to tell you, first of all, you're, you're actually probably right. The reason this, this uh, forgiveness is actually uh, very close to my heart, uh, this idea of forgiveness, uh, because there was a, a long stretch of time where I had to wrestle uh, with unforgiveness of, of my own. Uh, I am not good at this naturally or at all by, by any means. Um, so I grew up in, in a place in a church um, that um, I spent the first 17 years of my life there and loved it. All of my friendships, relationships, everybody that trusted I knew was a part of that church. And uh, we came to the unfortunate understanding at one point that one of the leaders was hurting people. Um, and it was brought to our attention. And that was interesting in and of itself because it was somebody that we loved and respected. And yet we saw them hurting people that we loved and respected. It was just a really weird uh, you don't know what to think about that. You're angry, you're hurt, you're in pain, uh, but you love these people. It, it, it was very strange. Um, but, but then we, this information, we brought this to some of the other leaders of the church, my family and a, and a few others. And, and quite honestly, the information was completely ignored. Not only that, a bunch of lies were told about my family uh, to try to discredit the information that was brought up against it. We also brought to the authorities and unfortunately nothing could be done at that point in time. Um, and we were lied about and uh, said terrible things to about myself and our family. Um, and unfortunately, we, we left the church. And in a matter of a couple days, almost two decades of relationships were immediately cut off. That hurt. And I remember thinking, I was consumed by anger in this moment. I remember thinking one day, one day they'll know, they'll know I was right. They'll know I was right and they're gonna come crawling back to me and they're gonna be begging for my forgiveness. A few years ago, this individual was arrested. Uh, more things came to light and they were arrested and everything kind of came to light finally. And I'll be honest when I tell you that not a single individual came to our family and apologized. That was hard. It was really hard. I remember uh, I had a lot of people who were influencing uh, my life and speaking into my life at that point in time. Um, and I was consumed by anger at anything. I'd be playing basketball and somebody would, you know, bump into me and I would flip off the lid. And I was so angry. Everything was consumed by this bitterness. I, my relationships were crumbling apart almost unanimously. And I remember that through the insight and the wisdom of people around me, and I do feel like it was a whispering of God's spirit, uh, I remember him telling me that if you wait for the day that they apologize, you will spend your entire life locked in a cell of bitterness. And can I tell you this right now? If you are waiting for somebody to apologize to you before you can find freedom and healing in your heart, you may be waiting for the rest of your life. God's forgiveness is not about who deserves it. It's about finding healing. And from that point in time, again, through incredible encouragement uh, from some of my friends and mentors at that time, I began a process and a journey of finding healing through prayer. And I'm not exaggerating when I tell you this, that it took years. This was years and years and years of asking God for the strength to forgive, the strength to heal, the strength to let these things go, to allow him to deal with it the way that he wants to. And over time, God began to heal my heart. And I'll be honest with you, there are days sometimes still randomly where I'll see an individual or I will see something that comes up and it triggers all kinds of emotions. And again, today still, I have to engage back with prayer and God again and again and again to find that healing because 
I'm holding on to that I think they deserve. I think that this will hurt them more. So I'm going to hold on to this, whether it's good for me or not. Prayer is the means in which we can wrestle with God to find forgiveness. And here's my encouragement uh, for you. This could be something small. We can allow very small things sometimes to, to fill bitterness inside of us. It could be something big. But my encouragement for you is to bring to mind, as painful as it is, that this week and the coming months, to bring to mind the people who have hurt you that you are holding on to this bitterness with. And I encourage you to begin a process of prayer with God. This won't happen immediately. It won't happen every single day, but this is a process. And I promise you that, that Jesus is faithful to heal. He is faithful to heal. Do not be consumed by your business. It will limit what God can do in your life. It will limit the things that will change inside of you. It will limit the things that will change around you. It will consume you. My encouragement is to engage with a process of prayer. God, help me forgive today. Help me to give this back to you. Today, I'm choosing to forgive again. Finally, last thing. I know it's true. Say, I don't know if I can forgive, and I don't know if I could even be forgiven for the things that I've done. That's a whole other uh, uh, realm of hurt. <laughs> To feel like I don't feel like forgiveness is for me because of the things that I have done, said, thought, whatever. Um, and can I tell you this, that Jesus is faithful to forgive. And the first step, the first step in a relationship with Jesus is a process of forgiveness. So if that's you today and, and you're saying, hey, I, I, I don't even know if I'm able to forgive. I want you to know, or if you don't know if you're able to be forgiven, I want you to know that, that Jesus is faithful to forgive. His son paid it all on the cross. And there is resurrection life in him. You don't have to do anything. You don't have to be good enough. You don't have to fix your way. All you have to do is say, Jesus, I trust in that. I trust in you. And I'm giving my faith and my heart to you. And he's faithful to forgive. And from that point, we begin the process of our forgiveness towards others. So is it possible to forgive them? I believe it is. I've seen it in my own life. I believe it can be true for you too. Not because of me, not because I'm good enough. Lord knows that I put up every fight along the way, but it's because God's grace is just that good. Let's pray. Father, we come before you understanding and knowing that we do not have the strength on our own. Will you allow us to forgive the way that you have forgiven us? Will you encourage us to uh, start in a process of prayer to learn to forgive? We pray these things in Jesus' name, amen.